Welcome to this Friday lecture. Um, the topic today is going to be NUMA systems and cache coherency protocols. And then later we're also going to talk about distributed memory systems. Yesterday we already started talking about NUMA systems and that they are um, multi-core and multi-processor systems. And each of those cores or processors has its own local memory. And things become complicated when other processors try to access data items that are located in this local memory. Yeah, things become even more problematic when there are cache hierarchies. Um, like then the ultimate question becomes what happens when uh, one processor holds a, a shared data item in, in, in their cache and another uh, processor changes it locally. So um, how, uh, what are the communication patterns to, to resolve this issue? Uh, luckily, the programmer doesn't have to, have to take care of this because there are so-called cache coherency protocols and those cache coherency protocols uh, are implemented uh, by functional units on the CPU. And what those uh, functional units more or less do is they make uh, memory appear to the outside world as, as if it was like unified and as, as if there were no, no local uh, memory or no local memory hierarchies. And the, uh, the, the uh, paradigm that is associated with this is called cache coherent NUMA, CC NUMA. There are like a bunch of different strategies that uh, that uh, can be that, that can be employed uh, to implement those uh, those NUMA protocols, and very simple ones are uh, are so-called snooping protocols. And those very simple snooping protocols are usually implemented in either of two ways. And we'll uh, only have a look at at write accesses. And uh, let us suppose we have a multiprocessor system with one, two, three, four uh, processors or cores, and each of the cores has its own L1 cache. And we also have a shared DDR memory, and then we have this shared data item here. Yeah? Like uh, each of the cores has a, has a copy of the data item in its own cache. And now let us suppose that C2 uh, wants to uh, write to exactly this memory address, like wants to overwrite that data item. And uh, one way those snooping protocols can be implemented is by, uh, by performing the write locally in the cache and then sending a broadcast message like, and uh, sending an invalidate message uh, via broadcast, uh, like broadcasting this message to all the other cores. And uh, the uh, other cores uh, accept that, uh, that uh, invalidate message and uh, acknowledge it and invalidate their own copy of the, of the data item. So uh, you can see that we haven't updated main memory. Like this would, would depending on a protocol, but this would probably happen happen later when one of the cores now decides to re to, to read this address again. Then uh, this core would have to implement some type of protocol so uh, that the memory also also is updated. Um, one way of uh, of implementing those snooping protocols is by uh, by uh, doing cache invalidation, and another way would be. Um, by simply performing the write access and then uh, broadcasting the actual data to all of the other cores. Huh? And then uh, the other cores have the opportunity to update their, their, their own copy of the, of the data item. And uh, this is usually uh, how those very simple snooping protocols would be implemented. And I, I, you, you can imagine this doesn't scale very well. Like when we have a, a, a wider architecture with more cores, then you can you can imagine that there's just a, like a bunch of uh, messages that are to be sent and a bunch of bunch of data that would need to be broadcasted over the bus. And those uh, two snooping protocols that I just uh, showed you are called uh, write invalidate, uh, like the writing processor sends a token over the interconnect and then uh, sends an invalidate message and then can update its local copy and the other protocol is called write update, uh, where the writing process distributes the data uh, via broadcast message, and all the other processes update their local copy. And as uh, this type of, of uh, protocol doesn't scale very well, um, there is a family of protocols uh, that is uh, more advanced and that uh, usually is used by uh, modern processor and architectures, or at least a, a variant of this protocol is uh, usually implemented by modern processors. And this protocol is called um, MESI. Um, MESI uh, implements a state machine. 
and uh, this uh, state machine is associated with uh, with the cache lines, and uh, each cache line can be in one of the following states. It can uh, either be modified, and that means um, it is a uh, local uh, local cache line, and no other cache holds this cache line, and it was also modified. Exclusive is 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 about the same state, but the cache line isn't modified. Huh? Like um, there's uh, one processor that uh, has exclusive access to the cache line, uh, but it's not modified yet. Uh, cache lines can also be in shared state, and uh, shared state uh, indicates um, that there are uh, multiple processors that have a copy of that cache line. And shared state also implies uh, that the data item wasn't modified. Invalid means that the cache line is just not used. And the protocol is implemented by, uh, by having the processors uh, passing messages to each other and uh, synchronizing, synchronizing the state of their, of their local cache line. So, yeah, let us just have a quick look at uh, how this protocol works and how those straight transitions work. And um, one thing I should mention is that at this point, students usually ask um, if it is necessary to uh, know all those state transitions by road, like for the exam. And uh, the answer here is no. So you don't really have to road learn all those state transitions. What is important that you understand the basic principle and uh, the objectives that the protocol uh, optimizes for, but it's it's not necessary to know all those transitions by road. No? So um, yeah, so we have our four states, the modified state, the exclusive state, the shared state, and the invalid state. And then there are state transitions that can happen um, due to certain events, and those uh, those events are either um, local reads, local writes, remote reads, or remote writes. And if we're if we're in the invalid state, and um, we uh, and the event is local read, uh, then we uh, check over the bus if the cache line is shared, and if so, we transition to the shared state, and otherwise we transition to the exclusive state. Like in, when we're in the invalid state, that means we basically know nothing about the cache line. Like we never touched it before, um, and so we also don't know if it's if, if any other processors hold the cache line. Processors hold the cache line, uh, so we have to check that, and um, and uh, so uh, we either transition to shared or we uh, transition to to exclusive. Huh? So in uh, this case, where we in where we uh, never touched the cache line. We have to perform like a communication over the bus, and in all the other cases, um, when we're in any of the other states, uh, a local local reads basically implies nothing. Like the uh, even the state stays the same. And then uh, we have uh, uh, local writes, and local writes cause the uh, state to transition to modified. And only if we're if we before if before we were in the invalid state or in the shared state, so. We are in a potentially shared state, or we know that we are in a shared state. We uh, send a broadcast message uh, to all the other processors, and those will invalidate their copy because uh, now uh, we locally modified it. Yeah. But if we are in the exclusive state or in the in the modified state, so if we so in in both cases we have an exclusive copy of the cache line and uh, local in local memory. Then we only have this uh, state transition to modified, but no communication over the bus. And this is actually um, this is the very case that we talked about when we discussed those simple snooping protocols that uh, always involved communication over the bus. And in our case, uh, we have this uh, state machine, and uh, based on the state machine, we can determine that we that there are no other processors that have. Uh, that have a uh, local copy of the cache line, and therefore we also don't need to perform any any uh, any uh, costly communication over the bus. Huh? So when a uh, remote read happens uh, over the bus, then the cache line becomes shared. Yeah? And if the uh, cache line was invalid before, uh, then we uh, have to have to uh, fetch the data from memory, like um, in order to uh, to serve the remote read. Huh? And a remote write access that we encounter over the bus causes the cache line to be uh, invalidated, invalidated, and then uh, we have to write uh, to, to 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 flush out the data back to back to main memory because now uh, another processor performed a write 
operation on the on the cache line. So a um, few things um, that are important to mention is that uh, cache lines can only be written to if they are in the modified or in the exclusive state. And therefore, like remote write operations are implemented using something that is called a read for ownership. And this works. Like we have a processor that um, wants to perform a remote write and uh, the processor knows that the cache line is in the, in the shared state and therefore it sends a, a, a broadcast over the bus to all the other processors uh, for them to invalidate their copy. Uh, and then the processor reads the cache line and sets it to exclusive states. So, uh, and and uh, then from the, uh, from when it has the cache line in the, in, in the uh, status exclusive, only then uh, will it modify the cache line and then the, well, we have the state transition to modify it. So a remote write is implemented by first reading the uh, cache line and by that also notifying all the other processors uh, that we, that, uh, we uh, want to have uh, exclusive ownership. So we perform a read for ownership and all the other uh, core uh, processors will invalidate their copy. And then we perform the uh, modification, the, the to write operation and we do this, uh, we do this locally. Huh? Um, if the processor holds a cache line in modified state, it uh, has to snoop the bus for remote accesses. Huh? And uh, only if a remote access is encountered, it will write its modified copy to main memory. Yeah? So MESI is, a, is an opportunistic protocol, like um, all communication over the bus and also uh, those, those, uh, those, those, uh, those flash operations to main memory, they are delayed as much as possible. Yeah? So um, the MESI protocol is, is uh, basically a deferred protocol in this sense. The protocol is optimized uh, for very cheap local reads, like uh, we, we, we saw that uh, most of the local read operations cost no extra work at all, not even, uh, not even state changes. And the protocol is also optimized for uh, local writes in that communication really only happens when the cache line is shared with other processors. But uh, on, the, on, the, as a, on the downside, um, writes over the bus are, uh, are relatively expensive. No? There is a bunch of other protocols that are similar to, uh, to MESI as they also implement state machines and they optimize for slightly different objectives. But um, if you have, an, have a fair understanding of how MESI works, um, you, you, you understand the principle also behind all the, all the other protocols. Yeah, let us just uh, quickly wrap up our discussion about NUMA systems and earlier I said that the programmer cannot really uh, program NUMA systems, <clears throat> but still there are certain means that the programmer can make use of uh, to make sure that the application actually uh, performs, uh, performs a bit better. Like, for example, um, one thing that you can do on NUMA systems is so-called pinning. And what is pinning? Pinning means um, <clears throat> like imagine we are on a system with two processors and each of the processors has four cores so we have eight cores total but our application only has four threads and then um, we can pin those four threads to uh, to one processor like the operating system is pretty is pretty much free uh, how to schedule those threads and by assuring that we um, that we that we only perform those uh, calculations um, on a single processor, we also guarantee that there are no remote uh, read or write accesses. Like, like this is an example, of course. Like, you might be there. Like it might, in, might in certain cases, actually be beneficial of uh, of distributing those four threads to two processors. Like, uh, but this is a means that the developer uh, can make use of um, in in that it can uh, control uh, or overwrite the uh, the schedule the. Uh, the schedule with regards to uh, how threads are assigned to, to cores. And the tools that are uh, usually used for that on Linux, there's for example the tool NUMA control and uh, on, <clears throat> on other operating systems there are similar APIs and similar tool chains. So this is uh, one way of influencing performance of your programs on NUMA systems and um, and earlier uh, we 
we, 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 we talked about atomic operations and I very briefly mentioned that atomic operations can be uh, slow on systems uh, with cache hierarchies and in particular um, what, uh, what is important to mention here is um, that atomic operations can be specifically slow on NUMA systems with cache hierarchy and I will give you, um, I, I'll walk you through very quickly uh, why this is so. Like, um, like similar to the snooping protocols from the four and the Maisy protocol that we discussed earlier, there are also uh, different ways how a uh, CPU implementation can uh, perform atomic operations. And I will first uh, show you a rather slow uh, way of implementing this. And this goes as follows. We have our processor that wants to perform the modifying write operation and therefore it sends a lock message over the bus uh, like via broadcast to all the other processors. And the uh, processors receive that lock and then they finish what they're currently doing. They, they're finishing their, uh, their current write operations. And uh, in the meantime, the uh, core that initiated the lock message uh, has to wait. Uh, and then the other processors, they send an acknowledgement message and the modifying core uh, receives the uh, uh, acknowledgement, me acknowledgement message. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, only when it received all the, uh, all the acknowledge, then acknowledgements, then uh, it can uh, execute the atomic operation. No? And and, and, and uh, then it will send a message to all the other cores that they can resume operation. Like this is basically a hardware implemented critical section. Yeah? And this is obviously very slow, um, in particular because all the cores have to wait all the time. Like we have uh, to wait for acknowledgements, uh, we have to uh, wait until the other cores finish processing. Yeah? And then all that wait time, uh, the uh, processors will, will, will probably do no work. Huh? Again, there is a faster way to implement this, and this is basically by using read for ownerships, uh, like basically using the MISI protocol. And um, like, like the read for ownership, just to remind you, um, this works by the processor that wants to modify first performing a remote read uh, and the remote by, by remote reading also telling the other processors that they, they should invalid, invalidate their copy of the cache line. Uh, and uh, after we, the, proce the processor has read the cache line, it will set it to the exclusive state, and then it will modify it locally. Huh? And so, on the one hand, uh, this there 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 is uh, there are no wait times implied because the processor just broadcasts the uh, invalidate messages, but it doesn't have to wait for an acknowledgement. Huh? <clears throat> And then when the cache line is in exclusive state, um, the modification will automatically be atomic uh, because it is the, this processor is the only, um, the, the, the only processor that, uh, that, that has access to the cache line. Yeah? So uh, this is actually pretty efficient. And let us now discuss um, circumstances under which uh, one or the other uh, type of implementation would, would be used on typical CPUs. Uh? Like um, what we were discussing now is uh, specific for x86, but uh, I have a feeling that other other architectures actually behave quite similar. Huh? <clears throat> like um, what is important to note here is that uh, Maisy operates on a per cache line level. Yeah, so when uh, Maisy um, changes the state, it changes the state for a single cache line, like this cache line here on the right. Yeah. And if we have a data item that like somehow overlaps two cache lines, like this data item here, x0, x1, x2, x3, uh, overlaps two cache lines, um, then the CPU cannot use Maisy and it cannot use write for ownerships. Yeah? And in this case, x86 uh, will resort to the uh, much slower lock-based, critical section-based uh, method. Yeah? So when we're in a setting where the data item overlaps um, more than one, one cache line, uh, then things become problematic. So we have to make sure that uh, this isn't the case. And I, like I said earlier, like with certain APIs, you can even perform atomic operations on compound objects, like on structs with a couple of different data members. And you, see, you can see where this is problematic, like when you have a struct that exceeds the size of the cache line, um, then uh, you you are in the situation where the slow mode is used. <clears throat> so another uh, issue here is alignment. Um, like when you have a data type, 
and the, the physical address of the data type doesn't have the same alignment as the uh, as the cache line, then this is also problematic. Yeah? Like um, cache lines are usually aligned on uh, 64 byte addresses. Uh, that is uh, when you uh, divide the uh, like 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 you cache lines aren't physically addressable, but if you were to obtain an address to the cache line or to the cache um, and you would uh, divide uh, that address by 64, it would also be uh, divisible by 64, yeah? like the remainder would al always be zero. Yeah? So, and in order so that a situation like this here doesn't happen, we have to align our data to physical addresses that have the same alignment as the cache line. Yeah? So, and just to give you an overview of the alignment of some data types, when you're like, for example, compiling with GCC, um, like characters, for example, will typically have uh, one byte alignment, or uh, signed integers usually have four byte alignment. Um, while in contrast to that, cache lines usually have an alignment of sixty-four byte, huh? and uh, you can influence that, and uh, you usually do so by uh, using. Like uh, by using language extensions, like uh, GCC has this language extension where you can uh, can annotate types uh, via attributes, and then you just tell it the alignment for that. Yeah, like there are also different ways uh, that you can align data, um, but usually you, you do this uh, through through those language extension. And like for example, the Visual Studio compiler uh, has has a, has, a, has different but similar extensions for that. So alignment. Is important when you're dealing uh, with NUMA systems and when you're dealing with atomics. Uh, um, but what is also important is uh, the size of uh, your data types. And uh, well, when it comes to that, uh, one important aspect is, uh, is is packing, like how the data is actually packed by the by the compiler. So I ran a quick experiment, and I did this with the uh, Apple Clang compiler. Like I would expect that GCC actually actually behaves uh, very similar, or that uh, the Visual Studio compiler does something very similar. So I uh, took those uh, those two classes, those two uh, data types here, like uh, struct p1, struct p2, and you will find that they are very similar. Like uh, they consist of uh, this integer array of three, and then uh, this uh, short sixteen bit variable, and then this uh, single character, right? Uh, and uh, the only thing where they where they are different is uh, is actually the order of the data members. Uh, like in the p1 struct, I put the uh, character first, and in the p2 struct, I put the character last. Like and uh, when you like I do it then I uh, construct objects of those uh, two uh, two types, and then I just uh, then I just print size of those. Uh, and when I ran this experiment and printed uh, the sizes of the two structs, I found that the uh, first struct will actually uh, be compiled into 20 bytes, uh, and while the other one uh, would be packed into 16 bytes. And why is this so? Um, like, uh, if you if you do the do the math, like you will find out, uh, or you would expect that uh, the integer array would uh, take 12 bytes, and the uh, short would add an extra uh, two bytes, the character. Uh, an additional byte, so you were at 15. Like, and then I, 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 I would assume that uh, the compiler adds some sort of padding, and I would end up at 16 bytes, right? Well, this is this is actually what we end up with for struct p2. And what happens for struct p1 is uh, that the compiler puts this character first, and then and then pads the character. Like, it will add a uh, uh, extra three byte as padding to the character, and uh, then it will uh, will and this is also due to alignment. Put the integer on an aligned dr address uh, right after the character, yeah, and uh, then it will put the the short like on here. You're already at sixteen byte, and then you'll add another two byte for the short, and that will also be padded, and so uh, you'll uh, you'll end up at, uh, end up at twenty bytes. So what you see there is that the order of data members uh, can pretty much influence. What your uh, what your data looks like and how your data is laid out in memory, and as we learned earlier, the uh, sizes and the layout of your data structures influences uh, influences cache performance and also influences how atomic operations are, how they perform on NUMA systems. So this is something that you want to take care of. Huh? And you want to make sure that your variables are packed in the exact Way that you want them to be packed when they are in, in a, when they are in inner loops. Huh? So uh, some remarks like when you are in architecture with um, with uh, large caches, then it's really good advice 
to uh, make sure that alignment of your types is um, is that you have proper properly aligned types, especially when you're using them in inner loops. So, um, and this is uh, even more important when you're uh, when you're uh, using atomic operations on shared variables. So those uh, what what we we are discussing here is is, is is very like very low level and but can actually have a have a uh, have a significant influence. Uh, on the performance of your code, and uh, even more so on Luma systems. Like, and um, when you're on a on an Intel CPU or an AMD CPU nowadays, you're highly likely uh, to be uh, to be to be working on a Luma system. So what we are discussing here is really relevant. Yeah. Let us just wrap up our discussion about Numa systems and summarize a little bit. And what we can definitely observe is that multi and many core architectures are commonplace nowadays. And they have relatively complex and complicated memory hierarchies. And so uh, NUMA is really the only way, as, as opposed to like SMP, to make this type of system even scale. And the non-uniform memory access makes a program behavior so much harder to assess because this adds such, an, such, a, such a huge extra layer of complexity to, to the performance of a computer program. And additional complexity is of course it is of course added by the fact that there are cache coherency protocols. Like they are, they are of course uh, they make things much simpler to the developer, but um, they add this extra layer of complexity on the CPU level. And this is of course very hard to control for the developer. But on the other hand, uh, good to know that uh, the systems behave in such a way. So um, after our discussion about NUMA systems, we are now going to talk about distributed memory systems. And distributed memory systems are actually uh, quite similar to, to NUMA systems. Like uh, when we uh, when we when we were at the very right end of our uh, of, of of our concurrency spectrum now. And uh, when we're at the spectrum where we're talking about locality of memory, like um, then uh, we have um. SMP on the one hand, where we have uh, unified memory architectures and uh, same access latency everywhere. And then uh, we have NUMA systems, uh, where we have um, local memories and uh, this problem with local and also with shared memories and the uh, the accesses now are potentially being being remote accesses. And then we have distributed memory systems where the um, processors are equipped with local memory, and then they are then they are connected over a network, and therefore things get get um, more and more explicit. Like um, we uh, usually cannot directly address this uh, the the other processors' memory, and we usually also don't have like cache coherency protocols. So uh, when we in the cache coherency protocols. When the processors send each other messages and all that that happened under the hood, uh, we now have to do this ourselves. Like we have to basically uh, send those messages around ourselves. And I mean, actually, disambiguating those two types of architectures is not always possible, because NUMA systems and distributed memory systems uh, share like like certain characteristics. And when we are talking about distributed memory systems, we are usually uh, meaning by that that the compute nodes are like spatially separated, so that uh, the compute nodes are actually different computers. Uh, like this is actually not a necessity. You can you can think of the uh, the Xeon Phi family of coprocessors from Intel that we that we talked about, like the system with sixty four Pentium processors on a board and the Ring bus interconnect. It's uh, it's pretty much valid to think of uh, such an architecture as, as a distributed memory system. Usually, when people talk about distributed memory system, what they have in mind is like a cluster computer or, or yeah, like a supercomputer, for example, where you have uh, have uh, spatially separated compute nodes, and those compute nodes are connected with an interconnect, and quite often the interconnect is just is just uh, IP uh, it uses uh, the TCP/IP protocol. And then uh, something on top of that, like protocols on top of that, but quite often in the high performance computing world, uh, there are like um, a very low latency, high bandwidth uh, interconnects, like for example, InfiniBand or MiriBand. 
DMSs are often hybrid systems, or, or it's uh, quite common that they are hybrid systems. Like when you have a PC cluster of commodity compute nodes, then it's uh, it's it's highly likely that each individual uh, compute node again is a Numa system or at least an SMP system, and uh, this makes them hybrid systems in a sense as that you have uh, uh, have uh, shared memory architectures or Numa architectures on the per node level, and then you have some type of interconnect. And uh, like I'm indicating a bus here, but it's not necessarily a bus. The topologies might be different. And, and, and on a high level, you have a, uh, a, a, a DMS, a distributed memory system, and each of the participants in, uh, in, in this cluster topology uh, on its own is again a NUMA or SMP system. And for this type of systems, there exists like a myriad of uh, programming models, like um, the simplest or the most low level APIs being TCP IP protocols like, for example, uh, network sockets, like those are directly exposed by the uh, by the operating system and allow to, uh, allow you to interface with your with your with your network interface. But then there are also other protocols, um, like for example, web based protocols, like when you're um, when you, when you're uh, using HTTP, um, then you're like uh, indirectly also uh, programming a DMS. As you're basically programming client-server com communication, um, in the high-performance computing world, that we are that we will place a bit, a bit more emphasis on um, what people use usually use is uh, so-called uh, message passing, and there is a uh, an API specification out there that is called the message passing interface. Like this is an uh, this is an open specification, and there's a couple of implementations uh, to this specification. So and uh, this is due to the fact that sockets are really are an interface uh, to IP-based systems. Uh, and IP uh, has a relatively large overhead only due to the, due to the protocol. Uh, and in the HPC world, the vendors actually uh, tend to do away with uh, with uh, IP because of the relatively large overhead, and then replace that uh, with uh, with proprietary protocols that only the, the the vendor uses, and on top of that, people can use IP, but then uh, there's uh, then you again have this extra problem this this problem with extra latency, and uh, instead in the high performance computing world, uh, usually use uh, on on top of those proprietary proprietary protocols, uh, people use uh, use MPI as a standardized platform. Like um, when you when you have a PC cluster and the uh, inter interconnect technology is InfiniBand, uh, it's per perfectly valid to uh, to run a socket based uh, or an IP based program on that cluster. But in order to get the maximum performance out of it and in order to reduce latency, you you really have to use MPI, as this is the uh, only cross platform standardized way to. To implement uh, high, high performance programs that uh, run on uh, low latency and high bandwidth network technology. The message passing interface is uh, centered around processors sending each other messages, and those mess messages are characterized by uh, who sends the message to whom. And the messages also carry along something that we call the payload, which are basically C arrays. And uh, on the source side, we have a C array with the data uh, that contains the message. And then uh, when the message is sent, um, we tell uh, the message passing interface how many bytes to read from that. And on the receiving end, the processor has a has also has a uh, pre-allocated array where it can uh, where it can uh, deposit that data uh, when it receives that. Let us discuss some terminology. So with MPI, we have like a bunch of processors that participate in the communication and they're usually connected uh, via some sort of physical interconnect so they can communicate with each other over a network. And then we have uh, some type of grouping mechanisms and one of those grouping mechanisms is our so-called communicators. And those communicators uh, allow us to uh, yeah, basically define subnetworks in, inside uh, this this uh, huge network, and this is this is a configuration thing. Like when we're running MPI on a cluster, we also provide a cluster configuration 
that will uh, identify which uh, uh, which compute nodes belong to to, to which uh, to which communicator. Huh? Like on the like what we have here is, is like on the on, on the upper left here we have four processors belonging to communicator zero, and we have those four processors here belonging to communicator one. Then uh, inside those communicators, we can uniquely identify each processor based on its uh, on its rank. So uh, this processor here is rank zero. This processor here is rank one, rank two, and rank three. And inside uh, the other communicator, we also have ranks, also uh, unique ranks, zero for three. And in order to to uniquely identify a processor, we can identify it through its rank and through its communicator. We don't have to explicitly uh, care about grouping into communicators, like when we uh, don't specify anything at all and don't take care of this during configuration. Then we will uh, get something which is called the uh, the the world communicator, and uh, the world communicator just subsums all the processors that are that are uh, known to MPI. Uh, as you can see here, um, we have uh, one huge group, and the uh, group uh, contains. 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, 7 ranks. Huh? Now there are, there are a bunch of different messages that uh, those ranks can send each other. And uh, probably the most common type of message is the so-called unicast message. And with the unicast message, we have ranks from one communicator, and uh, those ranks send each other uh, data. Like um, we have rank 3 here. And rank three here sends data, the so-called payload, which is um, which is identified through a buffer pointer and a uh, certain number of bytes that we want to send. And then we have to make sure that on the receiving end there is also a buffer allocated, that there is memory allocated where we can put that data to. And the two ranks have to agree upon uh, how many bytes are sent. Huh? And then um, R3 sends a message, identifies um, who the who the uh, message, who the data sync, who the who to send the data to, who the sync is, and um, uniquely identifies this um, on the one hand through the rank that he that that they, that they sent to, and on the other hand uh, through the communicator. And in this case, the communicator is just world. And those uh, calls in in this in this simple form send and receive are blocking. There are also uh, there are also non-blocking variants of those calls, but uh, they are a bit advanced, so we will not discuss them during this lecture. But in this uh, very simple form, those messages are blocking. That means when R3 sends data, uh, it uh, the the whole processor blocks and can can do no other work uh, until uh, the the sync has received all the data and has acknowledged that. So uh, those are unicast calls, and then. On the other hand, there are also uh, collective collective uh, calls or collective messages. And what's special about collective messages is uh, that the whole uh, communicator participates in those messages. Uh, like this is uh, here, for example, the broadcast message. And um, the broadcast, broadcast message just means we have uh, one rank, rank three, uh, that holds the data, and then uh, the and, and then broadcasts the message to all the other ranks. Uh, so in a C program, that would just mean that all ranks collectively call the broadcast function no? and they tell it okay we're in communicator world so the only the world communicator participates and uh, all those ranks agree upon that r3 is the uh, is the source rank no? and then they all have their uh, their own uh, data arrays uh, where eventually the uh, the the data will end up in and after this call the source rank calls broadcast and also the syncs call broadcast and then in the end, when this uh, blocking call returns, then uh, then all the processors and all the ranks in this communicator have the same copy of the of the data. So message passing basically gives us a very high level uh, API on top of uh, proprietary network technologies. As you can see from my description. This API abstracts away all the specifics about protocols and about IP addresses and about configuration, and instead has this uh, very high-level notion of groups and ranks and uh, messages that are that are passed between between ranks in that group. And I mean, you will probably recognize this type of uh, this type of communication, like like for example, send and receive calls or broadcast messages when like, when you when before when you when you 
when you worked with socket-based APIs, you uh, will uh, find those concepts pretty familiar. Uh, but the uh, message passing interface does away with all the platform specifics and with all the protocol specifics. Okay, while we are discussing communication primitives such as unicast or broadcast, uh, let, us, let us just briefly discuss where there even is such a thing like a uh, broadcast message. Like broadcast originally comes from radio or television broadcasts where you have uh, one source and then you have like a bunch of uh, uh, receivers but the sync doesn't necessarily even know uh, who receives the message. Uh, in uh, high performance computing, broadcast is more or less an optimization. Like, and therefore, we should briefly discuss how a broadcast API would be implemented. And a very naive way to implement a broadcast API would be to implement broadcast uh, in terms of just sending multiple unicast messages. Yeah? Like a naive way of broadcasting is we have this uh, rank zero here and it broadcasts uh, to the whole communicator which consists of uh, eight processes total and the, uh, the uh, rank zero uh, would in the first time step would send a message to rank one a unicast message in the second time step would send a unicast message to uh, rank two and then time step three a message to rank three in time step four to time step two to rank four and then time step five and so on and then after uh, after n time steps uh, with n being the size of the communicator we would have uh, effectively broadcast the message oh. And this is obviously a uh, very, very inefficient way to implement this because you, you might have noticed that after the first time step, there are already two processors that hold the whole data, right? And therefore, there is a more efficient way to implement broadcast and uh, make the complexity uh, log n instead of, uh, instead of n. And uh, this goes like follows, and people refer to this as uh, binomial tree broadcasts. And this consists of, in the first time step, sending the data to rank 1. And then in the second time step, rank 1 also has the data. So we have two ranks, rank 0 and rank 1, who, uh, who, who hold the data. And in this time step, both, both uh, ranks can send their data to, to other ranks. Like in, the, in time step number 2, we would see uh, rank 0 communicating all the data to rank 2. And rank 1 communicating all the data to rank 3. And then in time step three, we would already have uh, four, four processors and four ranks that hold all the data, and they would communicate uh, their copy of the data to the to the remaining ranks. Oh. And uh, with that, we effectively have reduced the complexity uh, the co of the communication pattern to uh, log n. But this is still noteworthy. Like when we have a radio broadcast, we effectively have a communication overhead of O of one, because uh, that is that is uh, from the from the perspective of the of the of the source, because the source doesn't have any idea how many uh, how many how many things are actually connected to it and how many things will participate in the broadcast. And this is different in uh, MPI and in high performance computing because uh, those broadcast calls uh, you're just totally clear who participates in the broadcast. Like the uh, whole communicator is known. And the source has to make sure that in the end, the whole uh, data is distributed among, among the communicator. And apart from those very common unicast or broadcast messages, there are also other message types like, uh, for example, scatter. Like scatter uh, sees one process having all the data and then distributing that data in a scattered fashion. Uh, that is, uh, there is not a uniform pattern to how the data is distributed, but rather there's like an, an arbitrary assignment of data to processors. Gather is pretty much the opposite of the scatter call, where you have data like arbitrarily distributed and the uh, one processor gathering the data like in a, in a relatively arbitrary fashion gathers those, da those data items into a linear buffer. Oh. Those are the uh, most important, or, or some of the most important message types uh, with MPI. I like the unicast messages, where the API functions are called MPI send or IP MPI receive. Uh, we have uh, broadcast, 
where uh, the associated C function is called MPI Bcast. We have uh, MPI Scatter and MPI Gather, which I just explained. Uh, we also have MPI Reduce. Uh, we will we, we will later talk about what a what a reduction a parallel reduction is. This is a parallel primitive operation, and we will discuss this later throughout the lecture. But there are dedicated MPI functions for these. Like, let us have, the, have a look at the uh, very basic structure of an MPI program. As we know, we have the uh, theory straight. And let us now discuss uh, how that actually translates into actual code. Uh, when I write a, a MPI program, that MPI program basically switches over its role. Uh, the first thing that you do is uh, you initialize MPI, and then uh, you find out uh, for the process that you're currently running, which rank it has. And um, in order to do so, you call the MPI com rank function. No? And with the MPI com rank function, you pass it the communicator that you're uh, currently operating in. And then you can uh, you pass it a pointer uh, to, to an integer address, and uh, then with that, you're able to find out which rank you are currently. Yeah? Like uh, this, this uh, process here. This main function will be executed by a bunch of processes. And uh, those processes are usually running on different compute nodes. And uh, based on the rank, uh, you can identify which role the respective process set has. Like if you were to call this function in a communicator group with uh, only two participants, then you could, uh, as a programmer, assign two different roles one role being that of master and the other role uh, being that of slave. And then you would associate a, uh, an integer ID with that. Like uh, you would identify that uh, rank zero is the master and uh, rank one is the slave. And based on that, uh, you would perform different actions depending on, on if you're either rank zero or if you're rank one. Oh. Again, this assignment um, that, uh, that that the run one rank is the like the master rank is pretty arbitrary. Like MPI will on startup just assign ranks to all the processes, and then uh, you will assign as a programmer you will assign roles to the different ranks. Huh. Like in this particular case, like like after some initial setup and after I found out uh, which rank the process is associated with, I'll usually have some uh, switch case or a, a conditional branch statement that will perform different action based on uh, which, which role we're, we currently have. And uh, in this case, we have the uh, master role sending messages and we have the slave role uh, receiving messages. And uh, let's, let's go a bit into how, how those uh, messages are actually, actually uh, executed. What you can see here is that I uh, that I uh, have this message here, and the uh, message is a C style array, like I have a ca constant character array here. And with MPI send, I send that message, and I also tell MPI that I'm sending four bytes. Uh, and uh, the granularity, so uh, the elementary item uh, that I'm sending in the buffer is bytes. Uh, and, and so and then I'm telling it to uh, send the data to slave, to the rank with ID number one. Like this is a unicast message, and the communicator is world. Huh? And on the receiving end, I just have a buffer that is large enough to uh, hold all the data. Huh? And I just tell MPI that I want to receive into that buffer, and I want to receive bytes, and I want to receive uh, bytes uh, from the rank with ID master of the uh, ID zero, and I'm also using the communicator world. And then in the end, I, I uh, tell MPI that I'm finished and I just finalize execution. Like this is what, I, what happens in the very end before, uh, before the program exits so that MPI has the opportunity to do some cleanup. And this is like the basic structure of an MPI program. You have initialization, then you identify which rank you are, and then you perform a different action based on your rank. And that action usually is comprised of sending messages and sending data around. And then, like a real world program would actually like do something useful with the data. And, and then in the end, uh, you finalize. And uh, then the processes uh, may exit. And when you uh, had this, uh, this uh, C or C++ or Fortran program, then you would usually compile it with a, with a special MPI compiler, like uh, 
like in this, uh, this case, I'm compiling with OpenMPI and I'm using the MPI CC compiler. And those compilers are, are usually just wrappers around the host compiler. Uh, like you usually have a, a host C compiler installed like, uh, like GCC. And the MPI compiler is basically a wrapper around this, uh, this compiler that does some, some extra MPI things. Yeah? So you would compile it and you, um, uh, you would do this with the MPI compiler to make sure that the uh, uh, MPI libraries are linked in, etc. Et and then um, when you execute that program, you uh, would not just uh, execute it, but you would uh, run it with a, with an, with an, a special MPI program called, uh, called MPI run. And that MPI run program uh, receives as, as arguments the name of the executable that you're running, but also the number of nodes that you're running on. Like in the example that I showed you before, it would make sense to run this example on, uh, on two nodes because we had roles that would assume there are only two roles. Yeah? And then uh, the MPI program would be uh, executed on, on a cluster of PCs or on a high-performance computer. So there are different MPI implementations out there, as MPI is uh, basically just a specification. And the most important uh, implementations are MPISH and OpenMPI. And it is worth noting that uh, MPI is a uh, Fortran and C specification. So those two languages are like first-class citizens. And there, are, there exist wrappers for all, for all sorts of other languages, like for C++ or for Python. Yeah, let's, uh, now that we have, uh, have an understanding of how MPI works, uh, let us have a, a look at a bit more real-world example. That is our Zaxby example that we discussed all the time. Uh, let us just, uh, let's just get, get an idea uh, how this would be implement, implemented with MPI. So I would again, I would uh, initialize MPI, and then I would, uh, would uh, first of all, I would find out um, which rank we are currently on. Huh? And I would also find out uh, what is the com size, the communicator size, and the communicator size basically just tells me how many ranks there are. Like uh, this is this is this is important in certain cases. Just 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 has to find out um, how to distribute data, for example. Yeah. So this program here uh, reads the uh, input from the command line, so the uh, size of the input from the command line. So we would retrieve our our n from somewhere, and then we would. Uh, we would initialize arrays and do some setup, like those are the arrays that the Zaxby example uses. Yeah. And uh, the rank zero, uh, say, would initialize all that data. Yeah. So we have our, have our global n, and the next thing that we would do, we would compute a local n, that is, we would try to find out uh, how, uh, we would find out the portion of those arrays that the respective ranks are responsible for. And here in this simple example, we just uh, assume that n is, uh, is integer divisible by uh, the communicator size. Uh, like when we have a uh, communicator size of 4, then I would assume that uh, n is a multiple of 4 to keep things simple. Uh, and then uh, next, uh, we would uh, allocate local buffers for only those, uh, those n that we are actually assigned to. I mean, this is actually very similar to the thread callback-based Zaxby example that I showed you earlier, where each of the threads was re responsible for a uh, equally sized portion of the uh, compu computational workload, and uh, this is this is the very same thing here, where I just uh, equally distribute the work among communicator size ranks. Uh, the only difference here being that I now have distributed memory. Yeah. And uh, therefore, I have to distribute the data from the one rank that is responsible, that, that has, or that, that uh, created the data to all the other ranks. And um, for that, I decided to use the MPI's gather and gather mechanism. Like this is, this is kind of an arbitrary choice because there are also other uh, mechanisms that could be used here, like for instance, unicasts or broadcasts. But uh, just to, to show you in this, this, this example, uh, to show you the uh, scatter and gather mechanism, but this is this is why I decided uh, to to use this this uh, mechanism and not one of the others. And what you see here is that I scatter both the a scalar, which is like really only uh, one uh, floating point value, and I also scatter the content of the y and of the x array. And I uh, again tell MPI um, 
what the source data is and what the uh, destination data is and uh, y and x are, are arrays actually and you, you can see here that I'm uh, sending those n local values and the values are actually not bytes like they were before but they are floats so I'm sending float arrays here right and then when the data is distributed those calls are blocking and uh, when those uh, calls return on all uh, ranks then I perform the actual, actual XP uh, computation. And I'm, I'm not even repeating this uh, here. This is just the ordinary XP for loop uh, that, 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 we, that we encountered so many times. And uh, it is uh, executed uh, not on the whole array of size n, but only on this, uh, size, on this, on this array of size n local. Yeah? So, and then in the end, um, the master rank gathers all those uh, partially computed uh, Zaxby arrays, uh, and then uh, when this call returns, the master rank has all the data uh, they gathered and uh, and has the has the data in local memory. Uh. And then in the end, I finalize MPI and the the program finished. Like in a real world example, I would do something useful with the data here, like I don't know, writing out to disk or or, or running some other processes on it. Uh. But in our example, this is it. Uh. So allow me some closing remarks on uh, both NUMA systems and on uh, distributed memory systems. And um, those closest closing remarks will be in the context of message passing. And if we take a closer look, we will find that the NUMA systems that we discussed are actually uh, tiny integrated distributed memory systems. Like they're distributed memory systems on a, on a single CPU or on a single board. And I mean, uh, the participants there are the individual cores, and they actually uh, pass each other messages. Like uh, they will send unit, unicast messages in order to obtain data that is uh, stored in local memory of other cores, or they will send each other broadcast messages in order uh, to tell other processors that they should invalidate cache lines. Huh? Like this is actually very similar, but it is uh, it is hidden behind cache coherency protocols. And then on the other hand, like when you have uh, APIs like MPI, those allow for oversubscription. Like you can run perfectly uh, run an MPI program on and schedule eight processes on a single CPU. Huh? And uh, when you think of it like this, then the fabric like QPI, which connects the uh, different uh, processors or the fabric that connects the individual cores, becomes the network. Huh? When we discussed uh, Moore's law earlier, and when we saw that processor vendors tend to, to add more and more cores to their processors and to their systems, then it becomes kind of obvious that uh, those cache coherency protocols uh, produce a lot of overhead. So if this trend continues, that vendors add more and more cores to their CPUs personally, I wouldn't be too surprised if they would actually do away with those cache coherency protocols and like placing that uh, extra burden of performing communication and ab about uh, managing local memory accesses, um, if the vendors would also place that burden on the shoulders of the developers. So at this point, I would like to finish our discussion on concurrency and on uh, parallel systems. Like we had a discussion that was theoretical on the one hand, but on the other hand was very practical in that we always considered what the APIs were that are used to uh, program those uh, concurrent systems, and those concurrent architectures. Um, uh, the reason why this is a good uh, point to finish our discussion and uh, stop short for today uh, is uh, because next week we're uh, going to, to make a bit of a switch and we're going to have a much more theoretical uh, discussion of parallelism in computer systems where we really abstract from what the underlying architecture is and we'll have uh, a discussion that is uh, based more on uh, asymptotics and on, a, on, on theoretical assessments about uh, parallelization opportunities and how that influences the performance of computer programs. So that's it for today, and I hope to see you next time.